great pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Carbon. Mike is a professor at MIT. He also got his PhD from MIT in the, in the group of Martin Renard. And uh, Mike is very well known for his work on approximate computing and also his work on self-healing uh, with the main goal of uh, improving the resilience of software. And that's also what he's going to talk about today. So welcome. There, all right, there we go. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk about moving from reliability, which is you know, what we traditionally think of a building reliable software that perhaps always computes the correct result, um, or even kind of more softly thinking about the probability that my software is gonna compute the correct result, to resilience. Where there we're talking about how can we operate even in the presence of failure and still return some results, um, perhaps even a different result. So and the way I like to talk about this and motivate these things now, oh, my clicker is not working. We have a clicker now? No. What's happened? Can I get a diff different clicker? Let's see. Oh. What is up with that? Try this one. Oh, no. Oh, actually, I may have, this may have frozen on me. I need more resilience. All right, I think, I think it did actually freeze up on me. Let's see. Oh, wow, I've never seen that before. All right, so I'm gonna have to try to move out of the way. All right, so the way I like to motivate this these days is actually, I was teaching a class on computer system engineering a year or so ago, uh, and it was fun. I was, we were talking with the students, we were talking about you know, reliability, you know, trusted core spaces, you know, what parts of your traditional software hardware stack do you actually trust to do the correct thing? And you know, here in this room, kind of we're broadly familiar with a lot of issues that go on with applications, libraries, compiler, and runtime systems. You know, students are familiar with these issues as well, maybe less so about compiler and runtime systems. Operating systems, you know, they are oftentimes, unfortunately, introduced to errors in the operating system. But, you know, something for the young undergraduate students is that, you know, they are always convinced that, you know, if I schedule some execution in my particular hardware platform, um, or uh, schedule some instruction, I am going to get what I expected back. You know, two plus two is always going to be equal to four. All right, and unfortunately, that's just not really true anymore in modern hardware systems. Um, at certain scales. So here, I think many of you probably in this audience have seen some of this, but you, know, you can go to the Intel website and pull down the errata sheet for your given processor, and it's gonna describe many of the issues that you're gonna have in the CPU actually sitting in your laptop or in your desktop. And some of these are relatively benign, right? Cache monitoring events, you know, unless you're doing performance analysis, maybe incorrectness in those counts are not going to affect you too much. Uh, but other things are much less benign, where the processor may hang or just do arbitrarily incorrect things. And this is actually starting to show up. So if you are a you know, prosumer, someone who's heavily testing the capabilities of your particular machine, you may run into these issues where they're locked and freeze up. If you're building a modern day supercomputer, um, even up to a data center, you're very concerned about some of these issues uh, because you're starting to find that it's very difficult to run these large scale computations without finding, running into faults at some point. And so the question really then becomes if this is going to be you know, a modern fact of life, and you know, we're starting to see this as well, if you guys are familiar with the Rowhammer exploits and vulnerabilities and exploits that have come out, where there again, uh, memory itself is starting to have some issues in the way that we're thinking about it as a reliable substrate. Now, if this is going to be a potential future, you know, what do we do about it? So before I explain what we do, it's important to draw some distinctions on how we think about how these faults manifest. And one distinction I want to draw out here is that the errors I want to talk about are going to be transient errors in the sense that they produce non-deterministic behaviors in our, in our system or our program. So if I run my computation once, it comes back with an incorrect answer. If I run that same thing again, I largely expect to get the correct result that next time. So these would be non-deterministic. And these happen for a variety of different reasons. There's the scale of modern process design has gotten to the point where starting to see these bugs that are propping up in these very odd corner cases of the designs. Uh, 
Also, as we continue to scale down the size of our chips, our memories, they're just physically becoming less reliable, and this is something we can't avoid, it's just the physics. And as well, there's still environmental factors like heat, cosmic rays, and other things that come into play. So now, what can you do? Well, so there's some standard techniques that we've thought about you know, from the history of computer science and building reliable systems. One is just replication, right? So I have some instruction, z is equal to x plus y, I'm gonna duplicate it. I have duplicate that implementation, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check to see if I get the correct result. If I didn't get the correct result, I'm gonna loop back around and try it again. And keep going until I get the correct answer. Now, another alternative, well, stop. So what's the problem with this at a very first step? Well, one of the problems here is now that we're duplicating our, duplicating our computation, we're gonna have additional performance hit, so that's gonna happen. It may not be as expensive as you think, uh, based upon recent results in actually implementing some of these, but there will still also be an energy consumption hit as well of duplicating this computation. So one approach of avoiding this entire duplication is by doing something we call checkable computations, where for a certain class of computations, you can write lightweight checkers uh, that actually allow you to check to see if you got a correct result. So here, if we have something like Newton's method where we're trying to find zeros in a particular function, some function f, and we're gonna start with some initial guess, well, what I can do is I can actually get my value, get my result x, and see if it is in fact a zero. If not, then I will loop back around and try again. Under the hypothesis that the next time I come around, I'm actually gonna get the correct answer. So these are reasonable ways of trying to recover some sort of reliable execution where I actually get a correct result from my application. But here, you know, in resilience, um, or in the approximate computing community that's gone on, right, there's always this other question of, well, what if we just let errors happen? Right? And you know, if you go through this mental gymnastics, right, if you're someone in this community, what you end up coming to the conclusion of is, well, this is fantastic, right? Just let these errors happen. It's gonna be faster, it's gonna consume less energy. Right? But of course, you know, in our community, we're always concerned about our systems actually producing the right result. I mean, it's the definition of reliable software, right? But this just isn't true. And a lot of my research is, but how do you actually demonstrate that it just produces a different result? Or an alternative result, right? If you like, think of alternative effects, right? And so these alternative results can be different in a wide variety of ways. It could be inaccurate, it could just be, it could be my computation reduces results too infrequently, correct results too infrequently. It could be something entirely valid that my computation is gonna do. And you know, in the back of everyone's head, they're always thinking that my computation is gonna do something completely nefarious uh, and destroy the world in some way. And there have been many different approaches, broadly, about how we might go around operating uh, in this environment where we let these errors happen and try to actually still get some guarantees about some of these properties that we care about. So for example, there's been classes of self-stabilizing algorithms that have been developed for a long time now, where you think of ways of where if a fault happens, I can prove that my algorithm will, in some finite number of steps, reach a state from which it's then guaranteed to correctly compute the answer or compute a approximate answer. We've also had a variety of systems that have come more out of this approximate computing community, where I'm gonna separate my application into things that actually need to be correct. These actually need to execute correctly, and other parts where it's okay if some errors happen. I'm gonna provide some empirical guarantees or some empirical observations about how accurate those parts of my computation may be. Right, as well, there are other techniques that rely more on traditional worst case style verification uh, where we look at ways of proving the worst case bounds that we may have for these approximate regions of our application now, as well as other ways of demonstrating and proving non-interference for a particular application. And finally, there have been techniques uh, where we've looked at probabilistic analysis, where we can prove, for example, the reliability for some particular computation, the probability of compute a correct result, right? And even more broadly, if you look at other communities, you know, they have looked at a variety of techniques for uncertainty quantification, where they're, again, interested in quantifying the type of uncertainty that they may have in the underlying hardware platform, but even uncertainty that may come from uncertainty of your model parameters that you have for a specific physical model that you're simulating. So what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today, and mostly about the bottom, um, is actually some systems that are going on in my group uh, with my graduate students. And one is Leto, where we're actually verifying application-specific fault tolerance properties by allowing platform designers to write these first-class execution models. That can be these you know, stateful execution models that can, that can actually uh, describe a variety of different errors that may happen in your execution. And, and along with these specifications, the verification system would actually weave these specifications in and allow you to prove standard safety properties as well as more relational properties like accuracy and non-interference. 
And what I'm going to talk about today, mostly, is going to be a system called Shuffle. We're going to talk about, actually, type-safe hand-coded probabilistic inference procedures. These are some results that we had come out kind of initially in a sketch of a paper uh, last year, and this system is very much in active progress. We're trying to come up with a way uh, to allow developers to write inference procedures by hand with some guarantee that this probabilistic inference procedure that they have is going to compute the result that they expect. Now, to motivate this, right, so probabilistic programming, and we typically think about it coming from the programming languages community, is often motivated around machine learning. And this is a relevant application for the system shuffle. Uh, but one application that we can think about, again, is going back to this uncertainty quantification. Where here, let's say we have a very naive and simplistic understanding of a computation f, where it's actually going to call some value g on x, and then call some value h on that result. What we can do is introduce a simple noise model. Where here, f hat, what's going to happen is we're going to have this e sub 1, which is going to model some noise that may come out in the disturbing, or from disturbing the computation of g. And then e2 is going to model some noise again that we may have. That comes from, it's actually, I think there's a missed parenthesis there. And that's going to model some noise that we may have coming from now the computation that we have for h. And we're going to assume, again, naively, that these errors are going to be normally distributed with some mu uh, and unit variance. So now, in this model, there are some questions that we might like to ask. We might ask to ask, what's the distribution of my error? Just fully, what is my entire distribution of error, which I can then use for other tasks? I may care about the expected error. Expected error I may have over some given data set, representative examples, or maybe even the entire space. I may be interested in the variance of my error. Uh, or I might want to do something like estimation, where I've run this computation many times, and I want to make some inference about what mu1 and mu2 may be uh, in this model based on the observations that I'm seeing. So this probabilistic inference process, right, and we can describe it just in pictures, is that we have some set of observations that we have in some space, and we have some assumption that these are going to be generated by some process where they're normally distributed with some mu, and that mu itself is going to have some prior in my space. And then the inference task, so assume that this is just where there's a single cluster or a single assignment, essentially, from these observations to a single cluster, then I can compute the mu or the distribution of mu that I actually expect given these data. Now, we can do this in a variety of different ways, a variety of systems you can use, but one thing that you can do is just write some Python code uh, to try to compute this task. And again, this model here, it's essentially a clustering model, and we're going to talk about it as we explain a little bit more. Uh, but this Gaussian mixture model um, is a clustering model, and there are a variety of different tools that you could use, but one thing, again, is to actually implement this by hand. Now, where this becomes a problem, however, is if you start to try to make this model richer. So let's say you have multiple cluster assignments, you want to model these, and if you are writing these systems by hand, writing these inference procedures by hand, they quickly become intractable uh, to one, write, and two, to reason about. So there are a variety of different approaches that have come out you know, from our community, from the statistics community, of how you can perform probabilistic inference. So I broadly put paint broad strokes of putting these in two categories of declarative approaches. Uh, versus hand-coded approaches. So in these declarative approaches, typically have a declarative specification of a model, and the system itself is going to go through the task of deriving an inference out. Right? And this is good because it automates some of this process, but you can also miss some good opportunities that you have to leverage problem-specific insight to get better performance, so basically make this estimation task converge more quickly for the particular problem that you have at hand. On the other part of the spectrum, you have systems that are more hand-coded in the sense that they require the developer or encourage the developer to encode some of the domain-specific insight that they have uh, to, in order to get this performance boost. So Venture, Blaze, Edward, just manually writing Python. If you talk to my colleagues in uncertainty quantification, this is what they'll do, just write all these instance procedures by hand. And this is good in the sense that you get this performance boost, but it's difficult to validate. Now, if the system shuffle, what we've been looking at are how can we actually build and system or a language where we can get both parts of this, where we can be correct on one hand, but also be flexible in the sense that we can write these procedures by hand. And the result that we have is a language, a set of operators for composing these inference procedures, as well as a type system that will actually type check the particular procedures that you have with respect to a specification, 
And as a result, we can actually write some of these inference procedures by hand and as well as use them to mate with some of these other existing systems where they may allow you to plug in some handwritten code to implement some specific inference procedure. Uh, and now we can actually come up with good ways of defining safe implementations of those plug-in modules. So I'm going to go through Shuffle today and talk about its architecture and talk about Shuffle and its modeling language. It's got some probabilistic primitives, a type checker, and as well as we do extraction to Python, again, allowing us to actually integrate this in a variety of different systems. So we can start with an example. So this is going to be a specification of this Gaussian mixture model process that we had from previous slides, where the idea is uh, that I'm going to specify the random variables that I have, as well as the prior distributions, as well as conditional distributions that I have on my model. So to take this apart, we can go piece by piece, and it's easy to start with the random variables. So these are going to be the quantities that we want to make observations about uh, in our model. So for example, up here at the top, these can be our data samples, our observations, OBS, it's going to be our data samples. Our mu are going to be these means that we saw, the means for these normal distributions. Our z's are going to be assignments. So if I have a set of data points, the way that I'm going to model this problem is that each, um, each, pro uh, each data point I have is going to be modeled as being assigned to a specific cluster which has an associated mean. So these z's, these z's are going to capture these assignments. So now this type notation that I have here tells you the types of variables that you have, these vectors. So obs is going to be a vector of reals. And this notation here samples. What it does is it gives us a domain, basically a domain of indices uh, that we have for our samples. So we go up and look at domains. What this notation is actually saying is that I have some arbitrary domain samples that looks like the natural numbers. So basically everything's from as an element in the natural numbers. And things that are element in the natural numbers. And similarly for mu's. So these are going to be domains that are unbounded in size and allow us to actually specify the domains that we have for our, our vectors as well. So now if we move down to the bottom, we have this part we're actually now going to get into specifying the densities that we have in our model. So these densities are going to be real valued functions that are going to compute one, either a prior distribution of parameters that we have in our model, where our parameters are going to be our mu's, or our z's, our assignments, right? or they're going to be a conditional distribution of our data given our model. So here, this is going to capture the fact that my observation i is going to be drawn, there's actually a bug there, there should be a z of i in there, um, is going to be drawn from some specific mu that I have, as determined by its assignment. So there's a bug here, but there should be a z of i, which is actually going to determine that j. So what this model does is it allows us to factor the density that we have in our model. So these were our densities that we had from our model specification originally. And the way that we're going to think about this is we can think about the joint distribution that we have for our model as being this factorization, where I iterate over all the mu's that I may have my model, I multiply that by mu i prior, which again gives me my prior density, prior distribution on my mu's. And then I'm going to product that times samples. When I'm going to enumerate over all my samples, I'm going to look at the prior for that particular z, and then multiply it by the density that I have for that particular observation. And this maps directly into our standard probabilistic notation that we have, uh, where we're factoring our distribution like this across the variables that we have in our model. So now if we go back and look at this, uh, so this type of specification is something that you roughly see in a variety of different systems, you know, Stan, um, Augur, you could see something like this, for example, uh, this declarative specification of this model. Uh, and where Shuffle takes an additional departure is that it now allows you to start to specify types. So what these terms are and what they actually compute. So what this type here means is that this function is quantified by some i, and I've alighted here there should be a colon and then samples, or mu's in this case, which denotes the domain of quantification. Um, but I lighted that just for space. And what this says is that this actually computes the density of this random variable mu at the position i. So that's what this function means. Similarly, we're going to have densities. Or we're going to have a similar specification for the density of z. Right? And then down here at the bottom, we have something that's a little bit richer. 
where it's going to say that this is going to be the density of i given mu i, mu of j, where j is actually going to be equal to the observation, the observed value of z of i. So it's actually going to be equal to the j that I have at hand, the cluster that I've been assigned to. So now if we look at the structure of these types right here, this is what we have are our quantified variables, some vectors of quantified variables. We then have a set of variables A, set of random variables A, a set of random variables B, and then we have a constraint. And this is structured to look like our standard probabilistic notation. Um, a and B are going to be disjoint sets of random variables. Right? And these are going to be quantified sets, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but these can be quantified sets that are functions of the quantifiers that I have. So that's where these quantifiers come in. And then they're finally going to be constrained. And this is going to allow us to actually express um, data-dependent declarations or data-dependent dependencies that we would have in our model. So for example, if we look at obs density, oh, this is weird. It's like my animations are broken. Interesting. Uh, if you look at obs density, so this would be our standard specification of a graphical model uh, for, our entire, uh, for our entire GMM, where my observation is going to depend on z, so the z at that i, as well it's going to depend on any of the mu's. Um, but given a particular mu, so if I know that obs has been assigned to this mu zero, mu at zero, then I can resolve these dependencies explicitly. So I know that this dependence is actually going to be from mu zero. Similarly here for obs one, it's going to be assigned at mu zero. Similarly here, mu one. So now this gives us a specification, a starting specification, for specifying a density that we have for our Gaussian mixture model. And then, given this model, we now want to actually build an inference procedure, something that's going to go through this exact inference test. When we talk about exact inference, and then I'll get to approximate inference later. But in this exact inference task, what we want to do is we're going to use shuffles operators to produce a, a term that has this type, which means it computes the density of my z's given my observations. So this is the inference procedure, and we'll break it down. But it roughly models what you'd normally expect for computing this posterior distribution. So a posterior distribution being distribution of some set of model parameters given the data that we have, in this case, our observations. And the way that we break this down is this term up here actually just computes the prior, prior probability of this entire v, z vector, so of all of our assignments. This next term here is actually going to compute the likelihood of the data given a particular assignment. This over here actually computes the joint probability of the data and the assignment together. And down here, we're computing the marginal likelihood of our data. And then finally, we bring it all together by applying Bayes' rule to get the d density that we're actually interested in. So now I'm going to go through and look at the structure that we have for each of these one by one. So the first one is going to be z prior, where we have this product operator. And what this product operator allows us to do is multiply some set of densities that I have in my model. And this multiplication is going to be quantified by some variable, in this case i, which is drawn from a specific domain that I have, so in this case samples. And the interpretation that you should have here is that I'm just going to simply multiply together all these density functions that I have, where each instance is going to be instantiated for a particular value of i. And now one way to communicate the semantics here is actually to show some Python code directly, which is you know, roughly models some of the Python code that we would extract from an operator like this. But C prior is going to be some function of the state, which is going to be the state of my model. It's going to initialize this result. This is then going to range over all the samples, call z i prior with the particular i that we have, multiply it in, and then eventually return the result. So now, this is an operator, and there's a corresponding type judgment that we're going to have here, where if I know that z i prior, and this is a little bit simplified, actually, from the real presentation um, that we would have, but z i prior is, computes the density of some i, then I can compute a product, then if I compute a product over that domain, 
then the type is going to be the density of that entire random variable. And correspondingly, a more general pattern here, if I have just some term of some term e and it has this type for some random variable i, for random variable v, then I'm going to be able to apply a product operator to it, and as a result, produce a term that actually computes for the entire v. Now moving on, so I'm gonna skip OBS likelihood. So this is a fairly drawn out derivation if you actually look at the program, so I'm going to skip it, the presentation of this talk, uh, but, and move down to OBS Z joint. So OBS Z joint here is computing again this joint probability of our data and our assignments. And what it uses is just a multiplication operator, which is actually just a simpler version of this product operator that we had. And here, you know, the intuition that we have behind some of these rules actually starts to become a little bit more clear. So Python, again, very straightforward. If I have these two terms below, I'm simply just gonna call them recursively with a pointwise multiplication. And then typing in this case, we see that I have a density that computes the observations, the density of the observations given z, and then have that prior on z. If I multiply them together, I'm gonna end up with this joint density. Right, and if you're familiar with probability theory, you know this general pattern actually just starts to look like the standard rules that we have of probability theory. And that's in fact just the intuition that you see from Shuffle's rules is that they are designed and modeled to look like the standard derivations that someone would actually use in their pen and paper proofs for inference procedure. All right, and we can now leverage those but have them checked by the system itself. So here again, I have some type E and it computes the density of some set of random variables A, given some other, density, some other random variables B, and I, E2 actually commutes the density of this set of random variables B, then I can put them together, pointwise multiplication, and get this joint likelihood. Oh, and get this joint distribution. So now, the marginal likelihood of the data. So here in our marginal likelihood, what we've introduced is integration. Right, so this integration is going to map as well to the integration that we have down here. So this integration operator uh, is going to operate as we'd standardly expect, but I'm, for right now, I'm actually going to elide the code for it um, because, you know, in general, these integrals can be intractable, but we'll talk about ways that we actually deal with these integrals in Shuffle and even different inference approaches that get around it and how we support that in Shuffle. So anyway, so for integration, if you were to produce a term, if this integral were tractable, for example, then you would have, if here in our typing derivation, what we have is OBS joint. It has the type of a density again, of our joint density of our observations in Z, and then we take this integral, which means we're gonna marginalize out the set of variables or the variable that we specified in this position here. So here, we're going to integrate out, and this is gonna result in a density, something that actually computes the density of our observations. And similarly, our generalized pattern looks again very similar to what you'd normally expect looking at probability theory, is that if I have some general term E that computes this joint density, or computes this joint distribution, then if I do this integration on the second variable, second set of variables, then I'll get a density. So then lastly, we have our last step. We're gonna apply Bayes' rule. And here, standard Python code is actually gonna look like a division. And of course, you need to be careful about situations in which this is gonna be zero. We can talk about that later. Um, but the general typing rule that we're gonna have here is instantiated and in its general form is that if I have some term E, and it's a joint density or, or joint distribution for A and B, and I have some density for B, and when I do the division, I'm gonna get the probability of B conditioned on A. All right, so shuffle thus far. So right now what we've exclusively talked about are just these density arithmetic operators. Uh, and they match to what you would do, again, on pen and paper if you wanted to implement uh, some of these techniques. And of course, we have the type system that enforces that these operators can really only be applied to the appropriate types um, when you're interested. And of course, Shuffle outputs Python, which is more complicated than the examples that I've shown here, but you get a flavor for how there are fairly straightforward, trans tra stra fair fairly straightforward translations for some of these operators. So now, so taking a step back, so we talked about this integration. And this integral that we had here is not tractable in general. So here you'd need to enumerate over all possible assignments of the Z. So basically all assignments of data to clusters. 
uh, which in general is not going to be a tractable thing to do. So a way that you would handle this is by taking an approximate inference approach. And what that means is that instead of relying on some particular inference strategy that requires us to compute this integral, instead, what I'm going to do is come up with an inference strategy that allows me to sample from specific distributions. So here, the idea being, instead of exactly computing this density, I'm going to get a procedure that computes samples from this density of my assignments, given my observations. Right? And making this change can actually result in a much faster or even just attractable inference procedure at the end of the day. So here, for example, this is some Python code that would use zsample, which let's say is a sampler. And what it would do is it takes some predicate of interest that I'm interested in. So some might call this an event. And for example, if I'm interested in the probability uh, that my observation at 0 and my observation at 1 are actually assigned to different clusters, then what I would do is actually enumerate through some set of samples as determined by count. So I'd collect count number of samples from this distribution, and then I'd compute an expectation. And depending on the number of, the number of samples that I have, and if I increase the number of samples, I can get some quality of result in my estimate of this particular predicate. So now, to implement this approximate inference approach in Shuffle, it's going to look like this. And I'll we'll step through it. Um, and I'll start at the top, but I'll, again, I'll lie at the beginning of this because this is, again, an extensive derivation that you'd have. But what I will do here is actually delve in a little bit more deeply of this type structure that we have. Where you can see is that these variables that we're talking about can actually be computed sets. Where these computed sets are computed by set comprehensions, constrained set comprehensions. So here, in this type where I have the density of z, so I have some type, or I have some object that computes the density of z at i, conditioned on the values of all the other z's, as well as the observations. And if I were to concretize this particular type over a, or ground this particular type over a specific domain where samples had three elements, for example, the structure that I would see and expect is that a density at zero would compute uh, that density given the values of z1 and z2. Similarly, density at 1 would be given the values of the other indices, the other z's, and then, of course, and so on as we go through this process. So these types that we have in Shuffle can be actually a little bit richer. So they allow us to express these set comprehensions of random variables, which are then functions of our quantifiers. All right, so now moving on. So this first object we have here is going to be a sampler. So again, this is going to be repeating this type that we just talked about and using it here, but now it's a different object, and that is a sampler. So what it does is it actually produces samples from this distribution. So the definition of a sampler is going to be as follows, semantically what it's going to do. So if I have some function s that can actually compute samples from this distribution, given some particular source of randomness and the current state, then given any particular function, if I take my samples as input and apply those to the function, then the judgment that I expect from my types is that this is going to compute the appropriate expectation of f with respect to my distribution. So where my distribution is going to be A conditioned on B. And the way that we implement this or expose these operations in Shuffle is that we have a sampler, this is a type, and its syntax is it allows you to assign to random variables that we have in our model and allows a sample command, and the sample command looks like you know, commands that you may see in other languages as well, and what you can provide as an argument to the sample command is the density that you may have at hand that you want to sample from. So the Python code that we would extract, you know, roughly would look something like this, where we produce a new state, we would sample, so for example, in this case, if we can use uh, a standard sampling mechanism to sample from this particular procedure, depending on the structure that we know of that density, then we can update that and then return that new state. All right, so the next one, we introduce another new type, and this is a kernel. So kernels are productive for, for constructing these more advanced um, approximate inference procedures where we really need to do essentially a random walk. So it's going to be a Markov Monte Carlo a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation where we're going to be taking steps, steps through our distribution with the idea that eventually we're going to produce samples 
on this distribution. So these kernels give us the ability to take primitive steps through our distribution. And the semantics is that if I were given some sampler S, and I get that result, and I apply a kernel to the result of that sampler, then that as a function should still operate essentially as a sampler. So essentially it preserves the stationary distribution that we have uh, for this underlying chain. So this is still gonna compute this expectation as we'd expect that we'd have uh, from our sampler, our original sampler. And so the implementation here that we have is actually two part. So the first thing that we do to create a kernel is we can actually lift. So we can take a sampler and create a kernel out of a sampler. And then in the next step here, what we actually do is we use this join operation. And what this join operation does is actually it iterates through the domain of a value, introduces a new random or a quantified variable, and then allows us to call a kernel, this should actually be zi kernel, allows us to call a kernel uh, with, with this quantifier. So this is actually going to walk through and actually perform assignments for every single random variable that we have in Z, so for all the positions of Z. And it's gonna generate an entirely new Z. And in Python, this would work as you'd expect. So this lifting is a no-op. Essentially, it's just something that comes out through the type system as a type judgment. This kernel here, however, is gonna do this iteration. It's gonna iterate through my domain, and then it's going to call the I kernel to produce a new state, iteratively update that state, and then return that state. So now in the last step, remember we're trying to produce a sampler here, and we have a kernel. What we're gonna do is we're going to produce this via a fixed point. So one property that we have for kernels is that the fixed point of a kernel function actually results in a sampler, meaning that in the way that we implement this and approximate this, if we run a kernel enough times, where count is gonna be some parameter that would be provided explicitly by the developer, then eventually we will produce a valid sample from our distribution, right? And of course, there's much debate of you know, how big count needs to be to get a specific level of quality, a uh, specific level of accuracy, and this is something that we defer outside of shuffle, uh, but it's something that would be provided and explored um, by the developer with the overall guarantee that there exists some fixed point for the set of kernels and samplers that we actually produce within our system. So backing back out, so that's a part of Shuffle, and we have a fuller language that actually allows a variety of other different operations for combining these base primitives of samplers, densities, kernels. We also have other low-level abstractions, such as estimators, for example. Um, and the result is that we can actually, via our type system, actually prove that if you're able to construct a term, it's a density, and you actually get this judgment, uh, then you'll actually know that that density does, in fact, actually compute the distribution of interest that you'd specified in the type. Similarly, for the sampler, if you construct a sampler, you know that, in fact, it will sample from the distribution that you had of interest. Similarly, with the kernel, essentially, it will be a step, an appropriate step, uh, in the distribution that you specified. And the progress that we're gonna have from here is that if you have a well-typed term that either actually executes successfully, or as I talked about zero, sometimes you need to, as I talked about previously, sometimes you actually need to be careful about where zeros may slip into your system, but this could be an alternative result, is that you may actually compute zero or actually throw an exception suggesting that you divide by zero. So now there's a little bit more in building this type system and reasoning properly about these types. So we need to care about type validity so what does it mean to even have a valid type? So as we mentioned before, A and B actually need to be disjoint sets. So this is something that we need to verify for any type that's given or even computed. Further, if I have some constraint, you can only condition on things that you're also observing. So that means that the set of free random variables that I may have in my constraint also need to be some subset of the random variables that I'm conditioning on. Similarly, there are multiple places where you may want to use or leverage coercions uh, in the type system, where I actually may want to change the set of variables, the representations that I have for a set of variables, or for example, even strengthen the condition that I may have. So here are other sets of conditions that we would need to check in order for these coercions to be valid um, and, preserve, and preserve preservation as we'd have. And so something that we've done in the design of Shuffle is we've ensured that these constraints are decidable. So all of these constraints, when desugared appropriately, 
uh, end up being in the quantified free theory of arrays or Presburger's arithmetic. So we can actually use Z3 uh, to discharge these assumptions or discharge uh, any of the constraints that we need inside of the, the type system. Now there's a little bit more here as well uh, in the sense that many times, there are two parts, um, well, in the sense that many times when you're building an inference procedure, you may actually make some unsound assumptions uh, about the behavior, about the structure of your model, such as statistical independencies, relationships that may happen, um, or as well, you may have some assumptions. Essentially, we talked about these, these steps, these kernels. You may have some assumptions about how much of the space these can actually sample. In some, case, some cases, some of these kernels, for example, that you put together or samplers may actually have zero probability on parts of the space, which is going to break some of the convergence guarantees that you'd otherwise have uh, from these iterative approximation algorithms. So here, Shuffle allows you, through a variety of primitives, to actually annotate some of these assumptions where you're making them and actually still produce uh, semantically correct, provided those assumptions hold, uh, types within the system. So here should be an additional assumption, but here something that we'd want to produce. So this is, this is before when I talked about ZI prior, I had elided the full specification of this type because we hadn't yet explained it yet. But here something that I'd like to do is if I have a density just for my ZI, I would actually like to coerce that into a density uh, that can compute uh, the density of ZI conditioned on all the Zs that have indices less than this current I. And this can be productive uh, for some of the type judgments that we have, where there's an inductive argument that's at hand at play, for example, in these product compositions, where you, sometimes you need an inductive argument. Right, and here, this is a, a case where you can make an independence assumption, encode that in the model through a coercion, and what Shuffle will do is actually record and track these. So at the end, when you type check your procedure, you can get the list of assumptions that were actually made while constructing this procedure, which can be productive for validation, for example, when you actually want to validate um, the set of assumptions that you've made in your particular inference procedure, the set of assumptions you made about the model. So extraction. So we extract a Python code, simple random primitives, and there's still challenges, of course, integrals. So I'd skipped this before, and I had motivated before, like one way to skip integrals is by moving to an approximate inference technique. But of course, another way to do this is there are certain classes of integrals that are unavoidable. Um, and as well, you can still actually compute with. So for example, when we want to actually compute some term that it's going to be, for example, a density for this posterior distribution that we have here, the mu's, given the observations, given our data, here, if we know that this prior and this likelihood, for example, if they're normals, uh, then do you satisfy a conjugate prior relationship? And there are standard techniques that we can use to develop a closed form solution that's actually going to solve and give us a result for that particular integral. So Shuffle will leverage these for the specific sets that it, specific relationships that it actually supports. And the way it does this is by doing pattern matching on the construction of these inference algorithms to actually find these relationships uh, based on using these templates of knowing what a prior is as well as what a, a likelihood is. So now in the results, so that Shuffle. Um, basically, it was a system, and the way that we went about evaluating it is two-part. One, we looked at the variety of different systems that are out there that allow you to do this declarative approach, uh, and we looked at sets of inference algorithms um, for particular data sets where we knew that we could get a performance improvement by doing something different, such as a collapse give sampler or a particle filter, and it's something that wasn't currently supported by the system. Now, many of these systems, again, support ways of modularly adding a fixed block of an inference procedure style, uh, and that's certainly possible, but we wanted to look for opportunities where essentially a developer sat down and said, oh, here is an inference procedure that I'd like to write, and I'd like to test it. And in fact, perhaps even test it before learning the various abstractions that you may have about that given system. All right, so we selected some set of models, a selective inference procedures, and as well as we looked at Venture. So Venture, as I told you before, is this another approach for building hand-coded implementations of these procedures. Uh, and what we found is we did a benchmark with Venture essentially to ensure that we weren't introducing additional overhead. Right? And at the end of the day, what we ended up finding is that because we have a very simple skeleton, and Venture does implement some low-level type checking, for example, and some other uh, things that it does on the fly, because we're able to do a lot of this stuff statically, we actually get a performance improvement over Venture in some of these cases. So this is just a few of the inference algorithms that we've looked at. Um, except, of course, for this example, um, 
which actually does generalize into these other examples in, in limited ways. And what we found is that you know, many of these inference algorithms, when written, have many, many opportunities for incrementalization. So here, for example, what I have here is a computation that's just computing prefix sums. And this will show up in many different forms uh, through some combination of essentially some sort of sampler that's enumerating over some space. Uh, when inside of that sampler you need to, for example, do some sort of integration, which may be a summation if it's in a discrete domain. And so what happens is you'd ideally like to translate that representation that we have here to this representation. And there's, there's an initialization error with this implementation, uh, but this is just simplified. Uh, and what this is is significantly faster because it actually notices that you've computed some things already. So we can reuse what we've computed in previous iterations. So provided that these reductions that we have are commutative and associative, uh, Shuffle's language can actually determine where you have these incrementalization opportunities and generate appropriate code. And here again, because of the way that we've designed Shuffle, it's actually decidable. We can actually determine if two consecutive iterations of some loop that we have actually have shared, shared computation. So we can actually decide this. And this is something that we get via the design of Shuffle's constraints and the overall computations that you can have. So together, coming back, what we have are the results. So from Shuffle, we have a way of specifying first-order probabilistic models um, with some fairly you know, rich specification for dependencies um, that are still constrained by the capabilities that we might have from Z3. We get verification through a type system. Um, and the broad motivation here is to bring these scalable and correct probabilistic inference models to more complex execution models, where again, what we want to be able to do is make probabilistic judgments about the behavior of our programs. Right, and to wrap up, you know, I think, broadly speaking, there are many, many opportunities for resilience. Right, it's a, a mechanism for dealing with inherently unreliable hardware. But something I didn't talk about, but again comes from this approximate computing motivation, is that there are instances where we can directly and explicitly introduce errors into our computations by doing approximation that are going to give us performance benefits. Right? And we've had a wide variety of results that have showed the performance benefits that we may get there. And through Systems like Shuffle, also Lado, which I didn't talk about, and other systems I've worked on in the past, you know, we are making some additional progress in figuring out how we can actually write applications, apply these resilience techniques, and still verify that they're going to get something close to what we want. And I think this is important not just for thinking about approximate computing or you know, unreliable hardware, at least unreliable digital hardware, but you know, a lot of the computations that we're looking at and that we've applied these techniques to are inherently uncertain computations. So there are wide opportunities for this uncertainty to be captured in various aspects of the computation. And as well as new emerging computational fabrics that we have, they all look very unreliable. They look very unreliable and approximate. So I think techniques like this are what's gonna actually enable us to make some initial progress in building programming models in many of these very interesting spaces that are coming up. So that's it, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so let me start. So, I mean, generally when you do verification, then one of the biggest problems is how to actually debug verification errors, right? And already in the like, conventional program verification case, it's really hard. Yep. I suppose in your setting, it's even more difficult to understand why things don't verify and, and how to fix them. So debugging the verification itself? Yeah. Well, not, uh, not the verifier. I mean, suppose you try to verify a model, yep. right? But it doesn't produce the result that you expect. You think it should verify, but doesn't. Wait, so hold on. Was it you verified a model, and the program still computes a result that you don't expect? Or? No, I think you try to verify the yep. model, right? Okay. You, you, you write down some types, yep. and you, now you expect Shuffle to verify that those types are actually correct, but Shuffle tells you no, they're yep. not. Right now you want to figure out why not. How do you do that? Yeah, so in Shuffle, I mean, this has been part of the exploration right now is actually you know, sitting down and figuring out, you know, what do these counterexamples look like when they come up? Um, typically, what we see in these cases is that, uh, for example, if something doesn't go through, uh, there might be an independence coercion that you might need to add uh, in order to be able to verify this thing, but you didn't anticipate that you needed, right? So it sort of it shows up as missing assumptions that you need to make, and it is fairly challenging. Uh, because now you need to figure out how do you mate uh, the performance you have in mind with the assumptions, the somewhat unsound assumptions oftentimes that you need to make about the 
the particular model at hand to get that to go through. So I'd say it is somewhat challenging. I think that's broadly challenging, true, of this approximate domain in the sense that you're interested in pushing these systems into places where there is unsoundness, right? So it really is this fundamental question of, you know, how unsound can I be? And this isn't a process that we normally typically think about kind of coming from our space of building reliable systems, so. Okay, um, Martin. So I had a question, like, I was wondering, so there's a lot of this, like, declarative systems as you code them, right? You write the model, you don't know what the model is, and it then does inference. Uh, and then this this other one, so you write the samplers and so on. So, so suppose I have a model, right? Some a little bit more complex model. And uh, how would I know whether, like, what's your thoughts on this? Like, how would I know whether to go with like a declarative system, like more general system, automatic, yeah. right? Or so, so this was the challenge, those? right? So when we sat down and we wanted to write some of these you know, more complicated inference procedures on some of these models, these probabilistic execution models, and what we do is we you know, pick up a model, we throw it at Know, PSI or Hakaru or any of these systems, and you have no idea if it's actually going to go through or whether or not. One, even if the system, you're going to really be able to export it. Sometimes these systems will just basically throw up on some of the models that you throw on it, and sometimes you just get extremely terrible performance. So I think it it is a good question. It has a little bit of this flavor that we have from normal program optimization where, well, you know, I rely on standard abstractions that are supposed to get me hopefully reasonable performance, and if that doesn't work, then I need to do something that's more high performance. So I'd say you know, that's the way that I look at this, is how do you build you know, the C or C++, or perhaps the assembly language, that you can then use and glue into these outerlying larger systems. Right? So that's something that we can try to do. But should I like <coughs> open the graphical models book and then basically go through the specialized inference algorithms and implement those in the, in the framework? Is this a good way? So implement all of these algorithms. I mean, someone like for some specific structures, right? You have a tree, then you have better. I mean, and that's the, the practice that you see from these systems, right? They, right. they have some set of inference procedures uh, that they know work well for specific models, and it's been driven purely by user demand, right? So now, if you're ahead of the development cycle for these systems, though, then the question is, what do you do? So, you know, when we were working with Venture, for example, what we've had to do is sit down and actually write these inference procedures work with venture stochastic procedure API, implement these things right, to get them done. And this is, it's okay in the sense that you can get these systems to fly, but you still have these concerns about whether or not that implementation is be correct. So this is one way we can actually extract implementations there. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Okay, so another question? Well, if not, then thanks again.